Hallelujah, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Please be seated. I want to tell you a story, a story about an unusual baptism I once heard from Bishop Tom Shaw, the former bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Massachusetts, where I used to live. It's not a story from the Bible, but I think it is an Easter story. Bishop Shaw was bishop of Massachusetts for almost 20 years until he died in 2014 after a long, very public battle with brain cancer. He was beloved, passionate about young people, not afraid to take a stand when he felt justice was at stake, a staunch advocate for the most vulnerable, a careful and compassionate listener, someone who was always open to trying new things, a man of deep prayer. In addition to being a bishop, he was a monk, so his whole life was grounded in his life of prayer. In any case, Bishop Saul struck up an unexpected friendship with one of the trainers at the gym where he had been going for his morning workout, a younger man named Ryan. Although Ryan knew that Bishop Shaw was somehow affiliated with the church, he'd never seen him wearing his clerical collar or purple, purple bishop shirt or large bishop's pectoral cross or his black monastic habit. At the gym, Bishop Shaw was simply known as Tom. There he was just another person doing his morning workout routine. Ryan was someone you might call a seeker, someone open to God and the spiritual life, but not formally connected to a church community or a faith community. One day, Ryan becomes a dad for the first time, when he and his partner, Laura, have a little baby girl named Isabel. On Ryan's first day back at the gym, after his daughter Isabel's birth, Bishop Shaw, of course, joins everyone else in congratulating him, but then takes him aside and says, so, what about a baptism? Ryan's never really thought about baptism before, so he tells Bishop Shaw that he'll have to check in with Laura and he'll get back to him. The next time Bishop Shaw sees Ryan at the gym, Ryan tells him that yes, they, they would be up for a baptism. So the two of them schedule a time for what Bishop Shaw thinks will be a chance to visit their home, meet Laura and her three children from a previous marriage for the first time, and arrange for the baptism. The following Wednesday evening, dressed casually, no collar, no purple shirt, no bishop's pectoral cross, no monastic habit, no book of common prayer, no Bible, Bishop Shaw pulls up to their house. Right away, he notices what seems like a large number of cars parked in the driveway. It's curious, he thinks to himself. He wonders if maybe it's a two-family household, or maybe if Ryan and Laura still live with their parents. Next, he sees balloons tied to the mailbox and wonders, what might that be about? And then, of course, it dawns on him. This is a party. They've invited their family and friends. Ryan and Laura have misunderstood him. They think tonight is the baptism. Indeed, when Bishop Shaw gets to the front door, Ryan greets him and introduces him to Isabel and Laura and her parents and the kids. And when, they come, when he comes inside the house, it is filled to the brim with people. The flowers and feast laid out on the dining room table confirm Bishop Shaw's suspicion. These people are expecting a baptism. Oh God, what should I do? Bishop Shaw thinks to himself, I need to make a quick decision. Something deep inside of him just says, go with it, do it. So he goes with it. They show him into the backyard, the location they've chosen for the baptism. Someone gets a folding table and a bowl from the kitchen cabinet and some water from the garden hose and they're all set. What more could they need? As the family gathers around, Bishop Shaw asks Ryan and Laura 
who they've chosen to be godparents. They tell them they've picked the baby's four-year-old brother and seven and eight-year-old siblings. Improvise, Shaw thinks to himself, as he asks the kids what they think it means to be godparents. They tell him that it means that if anything ever happens to their parents, they will be in charge of Isabel from now on. That's a start, Bishop Shaw says, trying to explain just a little more of what is entailed in being a godparent. As he gets to know the family more, it becomes clear, and not in any kind of judgmental way, that no one had any connection to church. So they talk about what it is they're about to do, and what baptism means for them and Isabel. And then they pray together, and then Bishop Shaw baptizes beautiful baby Isabel right there under the stars in their backyard. This had not exactly been what Bishop Shaw had expected. He, a bishop, hadn't exactly followed all of the rules and guidelines that the church has when it comes to baptism. He hadn't had all of the church plot props he was used to relying on, a church building to begin with, and a stone baptismal font like the one we have here at St. Peter's. But the people were there, and the water for baptism was ready, a feast had been prepared, and the table set. Today, Easter Day, the day of the resurrection, is also a day when we remember that God doesn't always act according to our expectations, that God isn't confined by our rules and guidelines or our church buildings, as important as all of these may be. Our Easter Gospel story from John's Gospel this morning is a story about expectations being broken open, if ever there were one. Mary Magdalene comes to the tomb early in the morning, expecting that the stone will still be covering the entrance, expecting to grieve and to mourn the loss of a beloved friend. Remember, Mary, along with the other women, had been with Jesus at the cross only a few hours before. She had watched him suffer up close. She had watched him draw his last breath. While he was still alive, she had heard him talking about being raised from the dead. But given what had happened and what a gruesome death he had died, she had surely let go of all those expectations. Even if she was able to enter the tomb, what she expected to find was a bruised and broken body, a body that had been dead already for several days. But when she arrives, her expectations are shattered. What she encounters at the tomb in those early morning hours isn't at all what she was expecting. The stone had already been rolled back, and instead of a corpse, she sees an empty tomb. Surely someone has taken the body, she assumes at first. So of course she goes and she tells Peter and the beloved disciple, who confirm that indeed, the body of Jesus is not there. All Mary can do is weep. She assumes there has been a theft, that someone has stolen Jesus until she sees the two angels sitting where the body of Jesus had been, whose question to her, woman, why are you weeping, only cements her expectations about what has happened. They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him, she says. Until, of course, in a poignant moment of tender comedy, she encounters Jesus himself, expecting that he is just the gardener, even wondering if he might be the one who took Jesus' body to begin with. Mary, he says to her, and yet again, her expectations are broken open. Here is Jesus himself, and she 
blinded by her old expectations, didn't even realize it. Rabuni, she says, teacher, running to embrace him as anyone would, a friend that they had seen to go through such an ordeal that they had expected to be dead, yet who is somehow now alive. And of course, her expectations are shattered again. Because of course, Jesus tells her, no, you can't embrace me. You can't hold on to me. Things are different now. It's not gonna be like before. We can't just go back to the way things were. The resurrection, it changes all of that. Instead, he says to her, you have to go. You have to go and tell my brothers that I am alive, that I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary wasn't expecting to hear this from Jesus, to be given this responsibility, to be given the most important job in all of the Gospels, that of being the very first person to proclaim Jesus' resurrection. Here she had come moments before expecting to leave the tomb as a mourner. And now she is transformed into an apostle, one who is sent out to proclaim good news. This is what Easter does. It breaks open all of our expectations. It breaks our expectations wide open. At first glance, the world may look the same this morning. Like Mary, going to the tomb in those early hours of the day, we might have gotten up this morning and had certain expectations for what we would find at church today. Maybe we expected the same old Easter story, the same people, the same Easter flowers, the same hymns, the same egg hunt. Maybe at first glance, our lives look the same this morning too. Maybe the world looks the same. The same old, same old. Maybe we know what we can expect from ourselves and from others. Maybe we got up this morning without much reason to think that things could be different. But what if, what if today, we actually believed that everything really is different. What if today, like Mary, at the tomb, we believe that God really is waiting to break open all of our expectations, to transform them and us? What if we really believe that God really is doing something new? something that exceeds our wildest expectations. I don't know what expectations you bring with you this morning. I know a few of the ones I have for today. But what I do know is this, that today, on Easter Day, God throws all of our expectations to the wind. God catches us off guard with new life. God brings to life all in us that was dead. God reminds us that just as the tomb couldn't contain Jesus, our expectations can contain God and all that God desires for us. This is the invitation that Easter gives us every year to encounter the whole world as a new creation, to encounter ourselves, our lives, and others expecting to be surprised by God. It is a paradox, expecting to be surprised. But then so is a man rising from the dead. The people are here. The waters of baptism are newly blessed and poured, and a feast has been prepared and will be laid out 
on this table. So lay down your expectations and come and eat. Amen.